Brian Stanton here with ASAP Frontline, joined today by Dr. Jim Neuenschwander. He is a research director for Genesis Healthcare System, adjunct associate professor at The Ohio State University. Uh, here today, we've had him on uh, before talking about some uh, pacemaker-related issues and interrogations and, and all of that exciting stuff. And today, we're going to start off with talking about where we are with hyperkalemia. We've got a little shift in the way things are and trying to figure out when and where and what we need to do in the emergency department. And so, uh, Dr. Neuenschwander, thanks for joining <coughs> us here, again here on the front line. Thanks, Ryan. Good to be here. So talk to us a little bit about the problem of the high K. Absolutely. Well, it's been a problem for a long time, and the resources that we've had to be able to treat it are limited. We've been working with K-Exalate for years and hating it. Uh, our nurses hate it. We hate giving it because patients get such horrible side effects from it, like diarrhea. And uh, there's been a good amount of evidence to show that they end up with colonic necrosis and even perforations. And the FDA has put a warning out against this nefarious drug and said, uh, use it with great caution. And now with uh, some new therapies on the horizon are actually being utilized now, potassium binders, we certainly have another option. So what are the just uh, our big concerns, what are we looking for in terms of the uh, hyperkalemia, uh, presenting thoughts, evaluation, those sorts of things. It's kind of kind of bread and butter emergency medicine but for the sake of a discussion on treating sure. it. Let's just run through the disease process itself. Absolutely. So we see people come in with hyperkalemia for you know, a myriad of reasons. Um, certainly we see it in patients with end-stage renal disease, uh, you know, patients on dialysis. We also see CHF patients diabetes, hypertension, and then one of the unfortunate side effects of some of the therapies we utilize to treat hypertension, like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, including any RASI therapy and even spironolactone and the other MRAs that we utilize in those settings, they will, as a side effect, create um, or cause hyperkalemia. And patients come to our emergency departments and need treatment for not just that, but many other things. So to be able to have something within our armamentarium to treat these patients with, rather than the old uh, throwback, certainly seems to be working for us quite well. Have we had any shift or change in that initial evaluation of hyperkalemia? Is there anything we, uh, else we need to throw in there? What are, the, what are the keys that we need to have uh, on that initial evaluation when somebody comes in? Well, you know, we always want to do the old uh, standards, which is to get them on a monitor, check labs. Uh, anybody that we're concerned about hyperkalemia is to get an EKG, because as soon as they're start, starting to have EKG changes, uh, their risk stratification obviously goes up to a much higher degree. Yet a lot of patients that have hyperkalemia, even in the early stages, will not have any uh, EKG changes. So to basically look at a patient and be wondering if this could be somebody, if it's somebody that we... Um, are very worried about potentially get a blood gas on them right away to get that potassium level back, or even more importantly, if the suspicion of hyperkalemia is high enough, just start treating with you know our standards, which are calcium, dextrose, insulin, and bicarb. Well, let's actually run through those, get a little bit of detail sure. on that management side of things, that initial management um, on who and when. Because I know we hear a lot and. You know, it started off with the uh, well, the insulin and, and, and the glucose with the calcium, and now we're saying we're going get hitting that initially with a little, maybe a little albuterol, things like that mm -hmm. to kind of shift as well. So kind of run through the kind of the ideal initial management in the initial, uh, emergency department of uh, hyperkalemia, and maybe even a little caveat if it's just kind of high mm -hmm. um, versus we're getting to the point where we're getting some significant EKG disruption. Absolutely. And one of the problems with hyperkalemia in emergency departments uh, medicine is that we don't have a gold standard. We don't have mm -hmm. a set of guidelines or standards that everybody follows. Um, Dr. Peacock, uh, along with some colleagues, a few years ago published something and they showed there was about 144 different ways that people treat hyperkalemia. But I say largely most people start treating around 5.5 and saying that that's uh, a concerning level and, and requires therapy. And at the very least, we want to start out with some calcium too pretty much stabilize the uh, membranes so that the cardiac tissue does not go into uh, any type of arrhythmia. So calcium is definitely uh, first line, but unfortunately it doesn't lower total body potassium. Mm -hmm. It's only protective. And then when we go with insulin, glucose, albuterol, you get a little bit of loss um, with that. And bicarb, you'll get some potassium to follow uh, in the, from the kidneys. 
But um, <clears throat> largely, if there's a patient that isn't making urine, even giving Lasix, which will get rid of some potassium to a degree, aren't going to be successful if, if they're not making urine. So those things up front really make the most sense uh, as soon as there's a suspicion or there's any evidence of hyperkalemia. And they're the initial, and they're not really for the clearance as much as that just that shift and in, in stability to kind of buy time. Absolutely. And that's what we're doing much of the time is to get any type of definitive um, excretion of potassium or get treatment. And one of our biggest problems, and I know you, I'm in a community hospital, you're in a community mm -hmm. hospital, is getting a dialysis team in fast as we can, probably after five or six o'clock. You know, nephrologists say they're on 24 sevens. And I guess that means 24 days a month, seven months a year, because it seems like for me, getting them in emergently is very difficult. So what we're looking for and, and now have is a way to administer something to actually get rid of potassium while we're waiting for them to be dialyzed or some other type of definitive treatment. All right, so the, st the standard for many years was that administration of the KX late, mm -hmm. starting in the emergency, emergency department, continuing in the hospital. Um, you mentioned a lot of the, of the side effects, but really the big concern that's really pushing it uh, pushing it out is uh, some of the concerns of potentially major side effects. So how, what, what are the reasons we are pulling away? And you kind of, you talked about a little bit at the beginning, but we're, I'm just kind of walking through the sure. entire process of evaluating and managing uh, that hyperkalemia patient. What are the big reasons that it, it's pulling out that we, you know, even as a consideration should probably be kind of staying away from this medication? Well, if you look at the, the story of kx and I haven't looked at this in a while, but from my recollection, there were five patients that were studied in 1958 in uh, Great Britain, and they had high potassium. They were given k um, Their potassiums went down, but three of them died. So they looked at each other, and they said, oh, working bloody well, mate. Um, you know, belly up, but stay close to the bathroom if you're going to use this. Uh, and then it was, you know, the, the FDA came into uh, being what year? 1959. So this drug gets studied in 1958. The FDA, which has no safety or efficacy okay. standards at that point, says, okay, we'll go ahead and grandfather k in. And that's basically what we've been stuck with. You know, when people say, hey, well, show me some evidence for the new binders and things like that, I go, show me some evidence for k -exalate. And there's really this dearth of uh, information. It hasn't, even when it's been studied, it hasn't been shown to be very effective. And it's been sliding through for years, uh, grandfathered in. If it were to try to get approved today, it would never make it through the process. Now, so what, where, is, where are we shifting to? Because that's where we've kind of been recently. <laughs> Don't want to put the patient on the KX late. But mm -hmm. at some point, we want to get something going that's going to actually start to drop that potassium level. I mean, other than uh, getting somebody into actual dialysis. How do we, the, what are the things we need to start considering in the emergency department in terms of actual clearance of potassium? Well, now there's some binders out. There's, there's two that are on the market. There's uh, Localma and Veltasa. And so with these two binders, what we do is we treat hyperkalemia the way we always treat it. Once you see that 5.5 or some people's threshold is a little bit uh, higher at 6, that we start managing them. And we give them the old standards still, calcium, insulin, glucose, bicarb, albuterol, whatever your favorite cocktail is. And then even in the emergent setting, we're utilizing these binders because mm -hmm. it makes sense. Because many of these people are boarded in our, pay, in our emergency department. It's going to be a delay before definitive care. Or we're holding on to them and hoping that they can excrete some of their potassium through the Lasix that we give or something like that. The wonderful thing is, is that we can give these medications after we've given the, the stabilizing. And both of them have an, an unfortunate, the FDA told them in their package inserts not to be used for emergent in an emergent situation. And what they really should have said was not to be used in an emergent situation alone. Mm -hmm. So if you see somebody, and when I treat somebody with hyperkalemia, I don't just give them a binder. I give them all the things I normally give them and then give them a binder afterwards. It's uh, in both cases, it's uh, a little slurry that's mixed with the binder. Patient drinks it, neither one of them tastes bad, neither one of them give you diarrhea. Uh, largely, uh, and then uh, the localma, which really, in the acute care setting, seems to make a little more sense because it starts to work within an hour. It starts to work in the small intestine, is lowering potassium. And there's been some good data that's come out in the three studies um, that has shown, uh, uh, you know, the harmonized studies showed that patients, about 66% had normal potassium within the first day, 92% had uh, normal potassium within 48 hours. And what we have seen from the data is even when you start with a higher potassium level 
uh, you know, like 6.27 in the studies, that it, it lowers quickly and you can see up to a mill equivalent uh, decrease within two to four hours. So how the, the question is, and what is the mindset behind the medications that we're using for, I mean, especially this class, uh, for clearance? You mentioned binders, but what's the process by which they are actually making stuff happen? Well, uh, in the locale, both of them actually uh, work in the GI system. They're not absorbed into the uh, systemic circulation. And in the bowel, they actually bind to potassium and then are excreted through the feces. In, with locale, it's zirconium. And the zirconium binds uh, in a three angstrom opening. Potassium is about 2.97 angstroms. It actually preferentially binds to the potassium and then is excreted out. Uh, and the higher the potassium level is, the more it will bind. The nice thing is if the potassium level isn't very high, it's not going to make the potassium level go down low. So we don't see a whole lot of hypokalemia with these patients because if there's nothing there to bind or the concentration isn't that high, it doesn't take the uh, potassium level too low. And that was actually my next question. So do we don't need, uh, there's not a specific dosing to worry about now that we're going to go from six down to one or... No, we haven't seen uh, very much of that at all. As a matter of fact, if you look at the studies, and one of them was done by Dr. Peacock. He's the second Mm -hmm. um, uh, author on uh, the third study. Those patients get down to around 4.2, 4.4, and stay in that range for out to uh, 48 weeks is what they studied it. So the nice thing is that um, we can get it down rapidly, and then it stays in a normal kalemic range. So is this becoming uh, our standard, one of these two medications, um, this class of medications, is this going to become uh, the standard for us to start initiating after our initial therapies in the emergency department as we admit them to the hospital? I think it will. Um, the, there isn't a lot of data yet in the emergency department that's been published. It has been studied, and my understanding is that the data will be out soon, and it is favorable, certainly. Uh, what we need to see is to um, either do a study or get some real-world data in where it's been used in the hospital and show that, hey, this is uh, a perfect setting uh, in the emergency department for uh, utilizing and starting this drug quickly. Um, we started in our department, we give a 10-gram dose of the Lokelma, um, and then we put them in the hospital. I know the package uh, insert says to give it three times a day, but largely we just give it once a day and it works fine for us. So. We're using it in the emergent setting and uh, seeing potassium levels come down. We're getting patients out of the hospital more rapidly. I had a woman patient that came in uh, a little while ago, a couple months ago. She had run out of her Lasix for a week, but of course she kept taking her potassium. Exactly. So she had a 6.1 potassium, comes to the emergency department. Uh, We put her in OBS overnight, gave her some, uh, you know, a binder that night and the next Mm -hmm. morning she's down to 4.4 and she's ready to go home in 12 hours as opposed to how long it might have taken her to get that down with the traditional way of just giving her Lasix. Obviously, we gave her Lasix, too, and we gave her calcium, bicarb, insulin, and, um, and, and uh, glucose, but uh, we found uh, some great success. Is there any, uh, any place, any populations where uh, we need to avoid this family and group of medications? Yes. Um, if you have a patient with severe constipation, bowel obstruction, because remember, it has to work its right. way through the bowel for, uh, to be able to work. So if somebody has a non-functional uh, GI system, then certainly that would not be a candidate. There is some question about uh, somebody with gastroparesis. I've heard people say that they use it with gastroparesis. I haven't had that uh, come up, but the uh, only people I'd really hold back on with it would be patients with uh, a dysfunctional GI system, either through severe constipation or maybe even um, at bowel obstruction. But we're not seeing the same, uh, and I've, I've actually seen some of the research on uh, some of these with the n- necrosis, with the mm-hmm. KX late, um, and then the difference between the bind- some of these binders. I mean, because they're all <laughs> a type, many all, they're all some form of binder. Sure. But these aren't. The, we haven't seen that those same type effects with the KX late with these new uh, newer drugs. Not at all. I mean, one of the great things is that we're seeing is, is no diarrhea. You know, I would always yeah. tell the hospitalist, yeah, I'm going to give them KX late, and then the nurse would give it to them, and they'd be drinking on their way out of the emergency department while on the you know the bed being taken to the floor. Uh, because my nurses didn't want to clean up all that poop, um, and it takes and it takes time. And we took a look at it. Our pharmacy said, if you break down the cost of this medication compared to KXLate, they were pretty equal. 
Um, the highest is probably going to cost the most hospitals is going to be about 15 bucks. Uh, a lot of dish or underserved hospitals. Mm -hmm. I, at our place, I think it's $3.71 a uh, dose. So we're not talking about an expensive drug. We're talking about something that has uh, a low cost but a high value in terms of keeping somebody from having um, a, an arrhythmia and uh, going back into a hyperkalemic state after we've kind of given them some temporizing measures. The other piece to watch out for, there are some side, well, the side effects in some of the studies, we have seen mm -hmm. severe constipation with one of the binders, uh, look, uh, Valtasa. I actually personally haven't taken care of anybody with that problem. Um, there was some peripheral edema with, lo um, with Locelma. And well, actually, did I say Valtasa for the constipation? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I want to make sure I talk about some of these things. The Locelma, there was actually, in some of the studies, patients had peripheral edema. And depending on the dose, they had more or less peripheral edema. Only one patient had to stop the drug because of the peripheral edema, and there was no pulmonary edema. Mm -hmm. We've been using it for a little over six months. Our nephrologists have been using it, and they haven't seen any problems with it. And then finally, the last place to watch out for is it does increase gastric pH a little bit. Uh, so there's three classes of drugs to really watch out for. Pradaxa, but not the other uh, DOAX, so just Pradaxa itself. Um, oral Lasix and Lipitor. And, and really, it doesn't do a whole lot more to those except increase their absorption a little bit. But technically, you should probably say don't give any oral medications within two hours of giving the binder. Changes in practice as we move forward with the treatment of uh, hyperkalemia. And we've been actually dealing with this uh, recently in our department uh, over the last year or so as we kind of transition away from uh, the old traditions, uh, old standards of uh, of management uh, in the emergency department. Uh, at least the front end uh, medications are the same. My recommendation though is, is take this, do your research, make sure you review uh, the data, the research behind them, the articles, break it down, see what's going to be right working with your pharmacy in terms of next steps in management. I would uh, pull together emergency medicine, nephrology, um, as well as your phar uh, pharmacy folks to kind of see what these next steps are and how you want to proceed in your emergency department uh, and how you want to do that, of course, bringing in your hospitalist too because at some point um, there, we're still getting the questions <laughs> of did you start, uh, insert here, right. uh, as we bring them in the hospital <laughs> and you want to make sure that um, you guys have a plan on how you want to, to treat uh, hyperkalemia in your emergency department. How can folks get more information uh, if they have any questions and uh, want to talk further about it? Um, you can reach me by uh, email at jim.neuen at gmail.com, jim.neuen at gmail.com, or on Twitter at the N-E-U, new MD, so the new MD. All right, so Dr. Jim Neuenschwander, uh, Research Director, Genesis Healthcare System, Adjunct Associate Professor at The Ohio State University. I mean, they even have me doing it now. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, like, it's like somehow that one university has... <laughs> Won the right to the word the. Yes. And I brought you Buckeyes, man. So how about I know you did. That's fantastic. That, <laughs> and I appreciate that. They're awesome. If you've never had Buckeyes, they are some oh, fantastic peanut butter treats. And, chocolate. and of course, we always twist them a little bit in Kentucky by adding bourbon to things, <laughs> and anything and everything to it. So uh, it's, it's fantastic. As for me, you can contact me at youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, and at everydaymed on Twitter. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. Thank you.